Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you so much. What a great opportunity to come in the middle of the week and to worship and to sing our love unto you. We love you, Lord, and we lift our voices. What a blessing. Thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to come and enjoy you here at Calvary Harupa Valley. Lord, this is the church that we've always wanted to come and fellowship at. So thank you so much for inviting us here, and we're just grateful. Allow us to invite others, Lord. Come join the fun. Come join praising the Lord. Church is fun. And thank you, Lord, for, after all these years, we've finally found a place. I mean, we've been here for, for many, many years, a lot of us, but still, this is where, this is the church we would always allow you to create. So we thank you so much that we can come, enjoy, enjoy you, Lord, enjoy one another, and just enjoy the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Father God. As we open up the Proverbs this evening, Lord, Proverbs 23, once again, just the theme of this proverb is self-control. Lord, we could always use that. So speak to us tonight, train us tonight, encourage us tonight, and then, Father God, we humbly ask, allow us to apply these things that you teach us tonight, Lord. That's the bottom line. The ultimate scenario, Lord, is let us apply these scenarios to our lives, to glorify you primarily, but certainly to benefit, Father God. We pray these things in Jesus' name and thank you. And say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 23. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, Solomon tells us, consider carefully what is before you. So right off the bat, he say, hey, Solomon is saying, hey, when you go to eat with a ruler, apply some self-control. This ruler, this overseer, apply that self-control. Put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. Boy, that's a pretty extensive position, right? But Solomon's not goofing around. I mean, this, Solomon is the ruler of rulers, right? And so he's just saying, hey, here's the deal. Be cautious, be careful. So if you're a man of appetite, again, apply some self-control. First impressions, we remember that, that saying, right? Hey, there's only one opportunity to make that first impression. So control yourself. Have that self-control. Put a knife to your throat if you need to. And, do not, and furthermore, do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. So Solomon is saying, hey, if a ruler is calling you in, be a little cautious. You know, don't be paranoid or anything like that, but be a little careful. Don't be swept in to what perhaps this guy may want, wanting to be kind of baiting you into. So be very careful. Be very cautious, Solomon is recommending. And we appreciate that. We receive that. So what a blessing. Furthermore, Solomon says, hey, do not overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, cease. I like the way the NIV says it. It says, have wisdom to show restraint. Again, this idea of self-control. Do not overwork to be rich. God will provide for us. He always has and always will. I overheard Connie uh, this afternoon counseling someone on the phone, one of the ladies, and, and, and I overheard her saying, hey, for those of us, God will not leave us begging in the streets. And so, I mean, I was just passing by and, and uh, just happened to overhear that, but I thought, oh, how appropriate. That's, we're going to look at that a little bit tonight. And, uh, you know, God is faithful is what the, the, the context was as I was walking by the hallway. She was saying, hey, God's faithful. He's provided, and, and she went on to say, he has provided and cared for you all these years. Is he going to stop now? And, of course, the, the answer on, on the other end, I'm sure, was, well, no, he's not. And that's correct. So don't sweat it. So don't over, overwork to be rich. God will provide. He'll provide abundantly. One of the main things that we tried to do, and we did well, thank you, Lord, but I always wanted to keep Connie at home. And we were able to do that the majority of the time. And those of you that have done that, that's not an easy project. Especially, I, I think it's easier than we make it, but we see our friends and things, two-income families, and so all of a sudden they've got a four-bedroom house, and we're 
in our little two-bedroom shack over here, which is more than adequate, you know, what have you. But then we see them with their new cars and, you know, hey, we're digging a, a hole in the ground for a pool. I mean, all good stuff. But single-income families, you know, I mean, the, the guy is just working hard, bringing in what he can bring in and saying, you know, the Lord will, will, man, you know, will manage with the Lord's guidance. And so we were grateful. I was so grateful that Connie was able to raise the kids in a stable home and always be there. And then she ended up homeschooling, which was, when she brought that to my attention, I thought, homeschooling? You need to go to the mental doctor real quick. Let me get, a, let me get a, a, an appointment for you. You know, I mean, we were, this is brand new to us. You know, now homeschooling is, is kind of secondhand. But back then, you know, 20 some years ago, my goodness, you know, pioneer days. But it was wonderful, though. But we had these opportunities to do so. So do not over, overwork to be rich. Don't worry about it. God will provide. And he has. And, I, and I'm speaking for and to the whole congregation. God has always provided for us. Always. None of us are begging out in the streets. So praise the Lord. So we thank you for that, Lord. Solomon goes on with this idea in verse 5. Well, you set your eyes on that which is not. Is that what you'll do? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. I can vouch for that. Every time I, I would think that I wanted to get to a certain place that I would consider my comfort zone, it seemed like the Lord would just kind of pull that out, something would happen, and I just would drop back down onto the level of, Lord, I've got to totally trust you, huh? You know, you kind of just pull that little stick, at, you know, that little level, and I just kind of drop down to that level. But again, God has never let me down, ever. But he has had to remind me a couple of times, look, riches will fly away to heaven. And I have to agree every time when he reminds me of that, I say, man, Lord, once again, you're right. And once again, we're not starving, Lord, so praise the Lord. So don't set your eyes on things that will fly away. Be very careful. Self-control, once again. Remain balanced. Furthermore, do not eat the bread of a miser. Isn't that something? Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, the miser says to you, but his heart is not with you. A miser. Remember Ebenezer Scrooge? I mean, that's a miser. Have you ever known a miser? I mean, not everybody has. I've known at least one miser, and they're weird people. They really are. I mean, I'm frugal. We're frugal with our finances, yes. I mean, we're wise with our finances, yes, but we're not miserly, not at all. And that's, there's a difference between being frugal and miserly. And as Solomon is saying, hey, yo, oh yeah, eat and drink. But in his heart, he's saying, don't you dare touch any of my stuff. And that's what he's saying. And Solomon is saying, that's what the miser is saying. Oh yeah, eat and drink, but yet the morsel that you have eaten by the miser's invitation, oh yeah, go ahead, sit down, let's, let's have a meal. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. It's just an oddball thing. And so again, Solomon is saying, if you go before a ruler, be careful. And if you go into the household of a miser, be careful. Man, Lord help us, give us wisdom, give us that word of knowledge. Those gifts, Lord, stir up the gifts in my life. Thank you for that. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. Isn't that so true? Furthermore, and we touched on this a little bit last time, do not remove the ancient landmark, nor enter the fields of the fatherless. Why? For their Redeemer is mighty. God is the fatherless Redeemer. God is the caretaker of the orphan. God is the caretaker of the widow, etc., etc. So don't fool around with the ancient landmark of the widow or the orphan. For their Redeemer is mighty. He will plead their cause against you. Big stuff. We stop and think about it for a moment. 
Furthermore, apply your heart to instruction and your ears to word, words of knowledge. Tune in. Like James says, and I'm very loosely paraphrasing, two ears, one mouth. Listen up. <laughs> Our drill sergeant would come in, and often that's how he would start his morning commands. Listen up. Oh, believe me, we were listening. <laughs> we were listening. Classic for today, verse 13. Do not withhold correction from a child. Oh, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Contrary to what the government of Southern California or the government of California would say, oh, gee, you beat him with a rod, he's going to die. Contraire to Scripture. You know, when I was growing up, and I'm not, it, it was just a reality. Man, I was beaten. I mean that. I deserved it. But when I think back on it, I'm like, man, I mean, wow. You know, with things, you know, stuff. <laughs> Whoa. You know. And there's, you know, it, it would have been absolute child abuse. I mean, there would have been jail terms, you know, back. You, you, I know you know what I'm talking about. I know you know that. You know, now, now I'm not condoning. There were some, you know, some moments. But, you know, we learn from that and, and we apply that to our own parenting and things. And we do a reasonable job. But to say, oh, no, you know, you can't lay a hand on a child. I had my nephew living with us for a couple of months, and the only reason he lived with us for a couple of months because he had the phone number of CPA, right? I didn't know what this was. I'm just trying to help this kid out. You know, he's a 13-, 14-year-old kid, and we're trying to give him a, a help, you know, some help, and give him a, a stable place to live. And, man, he just turned that whole thing against uh, my wife and I. And, really, I was the one that <laughs> benefited from that. Activity, And I'm telling you, my in-laws, they hated me for years, and I just kept my mouth shut because I knew what the truth was. I said, you know what, Lord, I'm not even going there. And eventually, <laughs> I went, we went and visited years ago, uh, years later, I should say, and I spoke to uh, the, the patriarch, uh, Big Reggie, great guy, stoic, a Native American face, big dude, you know, nicest guy you ever want to meet. But, uh, and, but Reggie, I thought, man, you know, we're going to Reggie, I'm going to stay at, on Reggie's property, you know, and this whole thing with my nephew, and, and thinking, man, I hope Reggie doesn't take my head off when I'm sleeping, and he came, you know, and uh, Reggie came up to me soon after we, we, we got there to visit, and he basically apologized to me, and then, he, and then he told me, he said, I know exactly where the unnamed young man uh, is mentally, and Wow, thanks. He just said, you know, thanks for, you know, your attempt and, and things like that. So it was a relief. But again, we're goofing kids up. Yeah. We really are. We're goofing kids up. And no, they sh no, no one should be beaten. No, by no means. No, not at all. But they need to be corrected. Their attention needs to be arrested. And then once we arrest their attention, then we sit them down and look them in the eye and say, look, this is what's got to happen. And one way or another, it's going to happen. I just want to, want to help you ha make it happen the easiest path as possible. But your behavior right now is totally unacceptable. And again, that's why my nephew only lasted a, you know, two, three months, because his behavior was unacceptable. You can't stay here under these circumstances. And by the time the sheriff delivered him back to my front doorstep for about the umpteenth time. He, the sheriff asked me, he said, do you mind if I talk to this young man for a moment? And I said, please. And this sheriff figured out what was going on. And this sheriff bent down and looked my 13-year-old nephew in the eye, and he said, if I have to bring you back one more time, I'm not bringing you back. You're going to juvenile hall. And shortly thereafter, the little boy manipulated his way out of my household, which in a way was kind of a, you know, I guess it was a blessing, but it, was, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a good thing. But we were desiring to open our home, and we did. And it was okay. I, I don't regret it. But man, it was a tough time because we were basically handcuffed. I was handcuffed. You know, I, couldn't, I could hardly raise my voice. Oh, precious, don't do that. <laughs> okay, boo-boo. You know, I mean, wow. 
Hey, <laughs> beat him with a rod, will you? He won't die. <laughs> he needs a good beating. But praise the Lord. Thank you for Solomon. Thank you for Scripture, Lord. You shall beat him with a rod, and here's the bottom line. You'll beat him with a rod. In other words, you'll get his attention, and you'll deliver his soul from hell. You'll deliver his soul. Praise God. That's our desire. We want to give people the good news. First of all, we've got to tell them there's bad news, but the good news is, is that we can turn from that. So we've got, to get, we've got to be allowed to get our kids' attention and deliver them from sheer, sure destruction. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart will rejoice. Indeed, I myself, yes, my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. Is there anything more joy-filled than to hear your kids that they're on the right track, or they say, hey, I'm, I'm fellowshipping with the Lord, I love God, I love my wife, or whatever the case may be. I mean, is there anything that just uplifts your heart more than that? To see and observe your kids or your nephews or whatever the case may be on the right track? Man, there's nothing more joy-filling than that. It's wonderful. Yes, my inmost being will rejoice. Solomon, the richest man in the world, the wisest man in the world, but he's just getting down, right down to the road, just saying, man, children, if you bless God, there could be nothing more fulfilling. I'd trade everything I have just to hear that over and over. Wonderful. My inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things, when your feet operate in the right direction, your hands and your thoughts are filled with loving kindness. Man, you'll bowl me over. We love our kids in that regard. Solomon is saying, absolutely, raise them to be good young men and women. Praise God. Do not let your heart envy sinners. Oh boy, isn't that tempting? We turn the, the TV on. What are they doing? They're tempting us. We turn the radio on. It's all just full of temptation. So do not let your heart envy sinners. That's what this advertisement, these advertisings are for, is to entice us into doing something that we generally probably wouldn't even know about, let alone engage in. But when we keep exposing ourselves to these sorts of things, and I know it's part of our culture, but man, we've got to have some self-control when we are watching the TV, when we are on the internet, when we are listening to the radio. We've got to apply self-control. We all do it, so if we're capable of doing it, then others can do it also, and we should expect that. We should expect that from our children. We don't give our kids a pass while they're young, so it's okay. No, once we discover there's some activity going on, we cut it off and say, wait a minute. I have the freedom to do that also, but I choose not to. I'm no different than you. I'm older than you, my young son, but you don't get a pass in this sort of activity. You just don't. I don't get a pass with it. I know it's destructive. I know it's harmful. I know it's not of the Lord. So I've got to apply some self-control. So guess what? I love you. You're going to get to apply some self-control also. Good stuff. We'll stay consistent. We'll stay consistent. So do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day, all day long. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Isn't it exciting? Wasn't it exciting today as we got up and we realized, man, Jesus, you might return today. And that made our day very exciting today, didn't it? Well, he might return tonight, but as we kind of start shutting down for the night, guess what's going to happen tomorrow as long as the Lord tarries? We get to say, Lord, I'm excited because you know what? You might return today, speaking about tomorrow's activities. Now that puts a skip on our step, right? Man, Jesus, you might return. That's exciting. So we're zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. We're excited because we know there's a hereafter. We know that. Hear, my son, and be wise, and guide your heart in the way, the way of God. Do not mix with wine-bibbers or with gluttonous eaters of meat. 
No, don't be tempted. Don't let your heart envy sinners, these wine bibbers or gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. And drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. That's a guarantee. Listen to your father who begot you. He loves you. And do not despise your mother when she is old. She cared for you. She brought you up. Was she perfect by any means? No way. She did our best. That's when I made peace with my parents a long time ago, realizing my folks did their best. And once that finally got through my thick skull, I realized that they did their best. I thought, you know, I'm good. I'm good. You know, they weren't mad at me. They didn't dislike me. You know, all the things that I generated in my head. When I got through my thick skull, I realized, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I'm good. I'm good. They did their best. So listen to your father and don't, do not despise mom. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also desire wisdom, instruction, and understanding. These are the desires that we want. We, want, we desire wisdom, instruction, and understanding. And when we turn our, as we've turned our lives over to Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit gives us Wisdom, instruction, and understanding, doesn't he? He does. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. And he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Let your father and your mother be glad. And let her who bore you rejoice. Let her rejoice. My son... Give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Somebody's watching you and I. The minute we walk in and identify ourselves as a Christian, guess what? People are watching because they want to see us stumble. They're not watching because they're in awe. Wow, look at that person. Wow, that gal, she's really godly. That's not what they're saying. I'm going to watch that guy because I know he's going to stumble. And when he does, you know what? I'm going to jump all over him. Because he's walking around saying that he's holier than thou. Now, I know that that's not what you're doing, but that's the impression people have. People think we walk around and we're wagging fingers. Oh, infraction. Tiss, tiss. That's not what we're doing. That's not what we're doing. But people are watching us to see that sort of activity. So we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. So the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Let your father and your mother be glad, and let her who bore you rejoice. My son, give me your heart, observe my ways. For a harlot is a deep pit, and a seductress is a narrow well. She also lies in wait as for a victim and increases the unfaithful among men. We saw last time that the seductress is where the Lord basically files the unfaithful man. And we touched a little bit on it last time. We see these guys thinking that they're on top of the world with this sort of lifestyle. And scripture, Solomon told us last time, oh, the, the Lord has allowed those men engaged in that sort of activity, he's allowed them because there's no room in God's desire or design for that sort of activity. The seductress is like a narrow well and she lies in wait as if for a victim. Guys think that they're hip and they got it all going on. Oh no, the Lord has, has orchestrated this whole thing. And man, I can only imagine how many of the millions of men have awakened to eternity that were involved in these sorts of lifestyles. Man, it just, it's sad. But it happens every single day because we're enticed by sin. We, en we envy sin sinners, and so we, we engage ourselves with sinners. Not this group here, but I'm just saying it in a general, general frame of mind. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of, of eyes 
Well, I'll tell you who it is, Solomon says. It's those who linger long at the wine. Those that hang around the wine barrel. Those are the ones that have complaints. Those are the ones who have wounds without cause. That whole idea, yeah, when I'm, when I'm drinking, I'm 10 foot tall and 10 foot wide. Yeah, those are the guys that kind of get, you know, slapped around here and there. They got, a, they got a mouth or they've got an attitude when they're drinking. Things like that. I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Well, those are the men that have wounds without cause. Those that hang around the wine too long. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Solomon says, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. People really think they're sophisticated. Oh, look at the body, and oh, smell the bouquet. You know, I mean, right. I mean, I just want to gag. You've got to be kidding me. You're that infatuated with rotten fruit? Really? Yeah, yeah, I, I really am infatuated with rotten fruit. I said, yeah, okay. That, that explains a lot of the things that are going on in your life. I get it now. Thank you for that piece of information. It's amazing. The things that we've presented as being hip and cool, and oh, you wouldn't understand, you guys out in Harupa Valley, what do you know? Yeah. Thank God. So be careful. With the, around the wine barrel. Because at the last, verse 32, wine bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and here's the real deal, your heart will utter perverse things. I'm convinced through experience and lived long enough to realize when someone is drinking or engaged in some kind of mind-altering activity, that's just the beginning. There's other activity that follows very close. Don't kid yourself. Do not kid yourself. Solomon is telling us, you're, when you're drinking, you'll see strange things. Sure, when you're intoxicated, but he gets to the heart of it, literally, your heart will utter perverse things. Yeah. So if you're allow allowing your kids, your adult kids who are living with you, if you're allowing them, yeah, you know, to pound a few now and again, trust me, there's other things going on. You know that as well as I do. Or if your spouse, you know, ah, you know I just knocked down a few on Friday night. Uh, I don't think it ends there. That's just my personal opinion. Your heart will utter perverse things. But it all begins with the, the altering of the mind. There, were, there are things people do that they would have never considered when they were straight. Never. Never would have considered it. But when they, their mind starts getting altered, then they, enter, they begin to entertain certain things. We need to be very careful with alcohol, very careful. We seem to have a very casual generation and even a casual generation of Christian leaders that in, to some degree seem to be turning a blind eye to alcohol. That's fine for those fellowships, but I'm, I'm trying to make it clear here that's not fine here. If we're in leadership here at Calvary Harupa Valley, we don't drink. We just don't. We just don't drink. Because eventually our hearts will utter perverse things, and that's not godly. Praise the Lord. As you're drinking and as you're drunk, Solomon concludes in verse 34, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or you'll be like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, hey, they have struck me but I was not hurt. You're hurt, but you're too drunk to know it. They've struck me, but I was not hurt. Oh yes, they have beaten me, but I did not feel it. That's pretty pathetic, isn't it? That's pretty sad. They've beaten me, but I did not feel it. Oh, when shall I awake that I may seek another drink? What a tragedy, right? 
I think all too many of us were semi-acquainted with some of those sorts of activities and were relieved to be far from that. And we can agree with Solomon. I mean, Solomon, this is experience speaking. The richest man in the world, not too many restraints. If he wanted to do something, guess what? The, the boss was going to do it. And as we'll see in Ecclesiastes, Solomon went off the, <laughs> the, the, the beaten path for quite a while. Thankfully, it seems that he had come back prior to his, his um, <laughs> transfer into the heavenly realm, into the, the presence of God, I should at least say. But yeah, so Solomon is truly, I believe, speaking from experience. And if not, he observed. And what a right on observation. Amen? Yes, man. Proverbs 23, a proverb of self-control. Let's ask the Lord to apply that this week. Yes. And when we do, be ready, though. When we ask the Lord, give me patience and self-control, you better be ready. So don't just flippantly or casually as we're driving out of the driveway, okay, Lord, let me apply these things. Because when you get on the 91 freeway tomorrow at 5 a.m., self-control is going to be the first thing that flashes on your dashboard. <laughs> the big red light. Amen. God bless you. If I could have the worship team come join me. What a blessing. What a blessing. <laughs> God is so good to us. You know, I think Jesus was the funnest guy in town. I mean, can you imagine being Jesus and hanging out with Peter and Mark and Thomas? Oh, I don't know, man. I don't, you know, I mean, all these characters. I mean, you look at the, the 12 apostles, Judas Iscariot, you know, really thinking he's getting away with something. You know, I mean, Jesus is kind of like, oh, man, what's going on here? But I think Jesus was probably the funnest guy to hang around with. I really do. I mean, he was, I mean, he was, is God, yes. But he, I don't think he was any stranger to having a good gut laugh now and again. Do you agree? Now that's something I think we need to apply right here at Calvary Chapel. Amen? Let's have some fun as Christians. Praise the Lord. Join us by standing. Hey, Sunday morning we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll pick up at verse 8. Reminding, the Lord will be reminding us that love never fails. So we look forward to that. I'll see you Sunday morning. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, along with communion and second service, we'll be having a baby dedication. And that's going to be great. So let's pack the house. Come to first service and then hang out for second service. What do you say? Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this evening. We're grateful. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom that you freely impart to us. We thank you for the wisdom to be able to sit at your feet, to hear, to listen. And now we pray, Lord, as you see fit, let us apply these things. For your glory, Lord, certainly for our benefit. In Jesus' name we pray. There is power in the name. Hi everybody, Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we want to challenge you, why not share these videos. You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of, of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been join, joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries. But again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much, and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.